Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, we'll cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home, and I'll put the kettle on. Hello, friends. I hope you are warm and cozy following last week's episode, because it's time to bundle up and head back out into the winter wonderland to enjoy a medley of merry scenes, from winter walks to snowy snacks. In our imaginary world of Idlewild Cottage, January is always dreamily filled with just enough snow and ice to make the out-of-doors both fun and magical. Let's step into the magic right away with Lucy, who discovers the mysterious wardrobe in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy and her siblings are playing hide-and-seek in the old house of the professor. Lucy finds the perfect hiding place. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats. Soon, she went further in and found that there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. Next moment, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it's just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy, and then she saw that there was a light ahead of her not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at night time, with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy began to walk forward, crunch, crunch over the snow and through the wood toward the light. And thus begins the marvelous story into which Lucy, and eventually her siblings, are swept. Another childhood walk is captured in the pages of Ezra Jack Keats' award-winning picture book, The Snowy Day. If you'll glance with me at the enchanted picture frame here at the cottage, we'll see the cover page of this story come into focus. Peter has awakened to a world of snow. Naturally, he heads outside as soon as he possibly can, where he is captivated by his little footprint patterns. He walked with his toes pointing out, like this. He walked with his toes pointing in, like that. I hope you'll look up this book and that this scene will inspire each of us to delight in simple joys, just like Peter. We find another solitary winter walk, highly different in tone, among the pages of Charlotte Bronte's 1847 novel, Jane Eyre. Jane's walk would eventually introduce a significant character into her life. It was a fine, calm day, though very cold. Mrs. Fairfax had just written a letter which was waiting to be posted, so I put on my bonnet and cloak and volunteered to carry it to Hay. The distance, two miles, would be a pleasant winter afternoon walk. I set out. The ground was hard, the air was still, my road was lonely. I walked fast till I got warm, and then I walked slowly to enjoy and analyze the species of pleasure brooding for me in the hour and situation. It was three o'clock, the charm of the hour lay in its approaching dimness, in the low gliding and pale beaming sun. Having reached the middle of the lane, I sat down on a stile which led thence to a field. Gathering my mantle about me and sheltering my hands in my muff, I did not feel the cold, though it froze keenly. I lingered till the sun went down among the trees and sank crimson. This solitary moment brings to mind a poem by Sarah Teasdale. February Twilight is a lovely piece for children to memorize. I stood beside a hill smooth with new-laid snow. A single star looked out from the cold evening glow. There was no other creature that saw what I could see. I stood and watched the evening star as long as it watched me. 
We'll enjoy one more solitary winter adventure before inviting some lively play into our literary scenes. Though perhaps Sam Gribley's walks aren't completely solitary. For the hero of my side of the mountain has plenty of wildlife to keep him company. Sam has just survived his first snowstorm, tucked away in his tree home while braving the mountain wilds on his own. When I came up to the sunlight, everything was white, clean, shining, and beautiful. The sky was blue, blue, blue. The hemlock grove was laced with snow. The meadow was smooth and white, and the gorge was sparkling with ice. It was so beautiful and peaceful. I looked for signs from the bear and weasel. His footsteps were all over the boulder, also slides where he had played. He must have been up for hours enjoying the new snow. Inspired by his fun, I poked my head into my tree and whistled. Frightful, my trained falcon flew to my fist, and we jumped and slid down the mountain. It was good to be carefree again. The teen years of Lucy Maud Montgomery, while not altogether carefree, were certainly filled with many lively frolics, as evidenced by the following journal entry from 1889. I went to prayer meeting this evening. When we got out, it was very dark, and Annie, Jack, and I started off together. There were four or five sleighs on the ground, and we had to dodge through them. As we went down the bank to the road, a boy came running up and collided with us. My hat fell off, and we had to claw around in the snow for it, laughing until we could scarcely breathe. Boys do have a way of adding a new element of fun to old frolics, as we see in the much-loved 1994 movie, Little Women. Laurie is warmly welcomed into the lives of the March girls, with Joe reflecting that they could now enjoy the novelty of having a brother of their very own. This brother is quite eager to join in the fun. In a favorite winter scene, Christian Bale hauls Joe and Beth on the sled as the willing beast of burden. Snowballs are thrown in the direction of the proper John Brook as he attempts to distinguish himself in conversation with Marmy and Meg. One hopes your girls will have a gentling influence, Mrs. March. Marmy smiles as a snowball sails by. Indeed, Mr. Brook. We see a similar companionship in the 1911 book Mother Carries Chickens by Kate Douglas Wiggin. In this winter scene, the children are starting off for school, meeting friends along the way. Mother Carrie and Peter used to look from the bedroom window of a clear, cold morning and see the little procession start for the academy. Over the dazzling snow crest, Olive and Cyril Lord would be skimming to meet the Carries always at the same point at the same hour. There were rough red coats and capes, red mittens, squirrel caps pulled well down over curly and smooth heads, glimpses of red woolen stockings, great parcels of books in straps. They looked like a flock of cardinal birds as the upturned faces, all aglow with ruddy color, smiled their morning goodbye. Another visit to Orchard House reveals that Jo March craves the outdoor exercise that brings that ruddy glow to her cheeks. This time we'll peek in by way of the book. In Chapter 5 of Little Women, we very much get a sense of Alcott's own energy and spunk. What in the world are you going to do now, Jo? asked Meg one snowy afternoon as her sister came tramping through the hall in rubber boots old sack and hood with a broom in one hand and a shovel in the other. Going out for exercise, answered Joe. I should think two long walks this morning would have been enough. It's cold and dull out and I advise you to stay warm and dry by the fire as I do, said Meg with a shiver. Never take advice. We can't keep still all day and I don't like to doze by the fire. I like adventures and I'm going to find some. Betsy and Tacy enjoy their fair share of adventures, too, and are the ultimate kindred spirits when it comes to honoring long-standing traditions. Picnicking is one of their favorite traditions, and in Heaven to Betsy, we see the girls, along with the crowd, embarking on a winter picnic. The sun shone benevolently, 
causing the snow to glisten as though strewn with diamond dust. They went down Pleasant Street and up a little hill, leaving the last house of Deep Valley behind. Halfway up the glen, a flat rock was soon swept clean of snow. The kindling brought from home was sufficient to start flames among piled branches. At first, the fire was a thing of bright beauty, leaping like a dancer. But it was allowed to burn down to a more serviceable glow. Alice put a pail of cocoa to heat. Carney and Bonnie were emptying the baskets, arranging hot dogs, buttered rolls, cookies, olives, and several cans of beans. Betsy and Tacy roasted their hot dogs with their arms about each other. It was good to be back picnicking beyond the big hill. Now, I know we visited the Ingalls family several times recently, but they really knew how to make the most of their winters. So let's enjoy a couple of excerpts from Little House in the Big Woods to see how Ma and Pa kept the days full and bright for their little girls. The snow kept coming till it was drifted and banked against the house. In the mornings, the window panes were covered with frost in beautiful pictures of trees and flowers and fairies. Ma said that Jack Frost came in the night and made pictures while everyone was asleep. Laura and Mary were allowed to take Ma's thimble and make pretty patterns of circles in the frost on the glass. One morning, Ma boiled molasses and sugar together until they made a thick syrup. Pa brought in two pans of clean white snow from outdoors. Laura and Mary each had a pan, and Pa and Ma showed them how to pour the dark syrup in little streams onto the snow. They made circles and curly cues and squiggly things, and these hardened at once and were candy. Today's medley of winter fun makes me curious about your own adventures. I'd love to hear about a memorable snowy or icy frolic you've enjoyed, whether as a child or even in recent weeks. You can message me on Instagram at Idlewild Cottage or tag me in your stories. Our family's most recent adventure was snow tubing, something I haven't done in years. I have to admit I was a little nervous at first, but it was quite exhilarating to zip down that hill with the icy wind hitting my cheeks and my family soaring by with the often repeated phrase, Look out, Mom! Well, friends, as we wrap up today, I'd like to share from Psalm 119. I've been listening to this chapter while walking in the morning or when settling down to sleep at night, and this phrase caught my attention as I was circling the wetlands path the other day. The earth is filled with your love, O Lord. It's indeed an earth of wintry snows, rushing winds, pale moons, and starry skies. And it's a world in which we are loved by the one who created it all. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage.